You know, today we'll be hearing from Vera Schiff, author and Holocaust survivor. Uh, Vera has worked with our center over many years and has spoken to thousands, literally thousands, of students and teachers in the GTA and beyond. Vera was born in Prague in 1926. In 1942, Vera, along with her family, was deported to Terezen, also known as Theresienstadt concentration camp. Over the next three years, Vera witnessed unspeakable horrors inflicted on those around her, including the deaths of everyone in her immediate family. On May 8, 1945, she, along with other survivors, were liberated from the camp by the Russian army. She returned to Prague, a city that no longer felt like home to her, not with the absence of over 50 immediate and extended family members who had perished in the Holocaust. Her testimony that she'll be sharing with us today will touch on various aspects of her, her experience prior to, during, and after the Holocaust. We thank her and commend her on her courage in reliving this unimaginable tragedy in order to educate us today. Now I'm going to turn the floor over to Vera. As I mentioned, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and we will address them at the end of the presentation. All right, Vera, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. And I hope that we will we spend together an interesting hour in which I would like to share with you my past experiences, which, which are extremely painful, but I do share them with thousands, yet millions of people who suffered through this tragic era, which we are so hard to try to uh, share with you in order to prevent, God forbid, a repetition. So as you said, I come from Europe. I was born in Prague. Uh, capital city of, of the Czech Republic, which in those days, uh, before the Nazi invasion, seemed on a way to more democratic or tolerant level than the Austro-Hungarian Empire was before that. And we all hoped, falsely hoped, that we will be able to be tolerated and that all the biases and anti-Semitism will be gradually waning by assimilation and people entering into the mainstream. Well, it wasn't to be because in Nazi Germany with this uh, racial policy of Nazi su Aryan superiority became obvious that the Jews are now in a very dire straits and that we will not be having future in Europe. Worse yet, we had no future anywhere because there was nowhere to go and no country that would have offered a haven for this very tragic time. So it started really very quickly in, when March 1539, the Nazi army, the Wehrmacht, entered uh, the, occupied the country and began almost immediately uh, to implement the, the Nuremberg racial laws, which excluded all Jews from all walks of life. It was gradual, but it was really very fast. So my father, who was a lawyer in the employ of the Czechoslovak government in the finance department, was kicked out of his office within hours virtually of the occupation. And from then on, it went very quickly downhill, not only with us, with everybody. Bus Jewish businesses were expropriated. Jewish doctors had to close their clinics. Everything was very quickly being uh, on, a, on a destructive path. Soon, we couldn't use the public transit. We couldn't shop with people. We couldn't, uh, uh, we were forced to wear the yellow star of David, which was a yellow patch, which was to be attached to our outer clothing and which was to indicate to people who we are, indicating that we are really free for all. If anybody decided to, for some reason to vent their ill mood or anger on a Jew, the Jew was defenseless because police would never come to our help. And we children, I was then a very young girl and I had a sister who was two years my senior. We really didn't know what has hit us because up until then we had a very sheltered, comfortable home. And I've, I didn't really, realized that being a Jew was such an enormous problem to so many people. Maybe because my father had a rather prominent position in the Czech government that I had somehow lived in a sh very sheltered environment. But soon we, that had of course changed because I can tell you even today I remember, I remember distinctly the hour when my mother sent me with that yellow star on my coat and she said, just go and it has got to be always visible. And, you know, I was scared because I was, I knew that anybody who wants to do whatever to a kid like me would be unopposed. So I remember walking to streets, which I was before running and feeling free, suddenly like on eggshells, always expecting the spit or the blow or the, the stone. It never came. And I, till today, I'm grateful that uh, uh, Czechs never really 
at least those I met, take advantage out of the possibility uh, to vent on any angle on, on a Jew because nobody would have prevented them. So now, Sumi, uh, my father, because he lost his job, and this was without any pensions, we have allowed, all our assets were frozen. So we were allowed on a small stipend to withdraw monthly from our savings. And that was all too little and inadequate. But that became very quickly obvious that two will not last and that we will not be able to stay in those cities and towns where we lived for centuries. The Ch Jewish presence in this part of the world dates from the 10th century onward. Jews were involved in many uh, walks of life, business, uh, academic pursuits, in as much it was permitted, because the destiny of Jews in Europe wasn't always um, favorable. But of course, it was never as horrendously aggressive and destructive as under the Nazis. So now we have realized that we will be expelled somewhere to the East. The East was always a huge shadow in front of us. We we feared because it didn't have a name, it didn't have a location, and we didn't really know what was in store for us. And rumors had it that what's in store for us is, of course, unspeakable, unimaginable. But, you know, it is human disposition, particularly for young girls like my sister and I, that we always hoped, we thought that the, the possible some of it physically harm or uh, do something uh, like killing people in cold blood for no good reason but the one that you were born a Jew. But you know, if it's a, a passage of time, people were vanishing in that in these transport to the east, and there were never any messages or any uh, notes or any letters. So you began to wonder. And from Prague, the first transport were dispatched to the Polish ghetto in Litzmannstadt or Lodz. And this was overcrowded. And to that end, then the Nazis decided to open a transit camp in Theresienstadt, which was a garrison town. Well, and before it was a fortress, really, a, you know, a, the way to the e northeast of Europe. We didn't know little about it. But my father, uh, now I have come back to his uh, work, he, as he was in charge of the, the government monopoly of distribution of tobacco, which was allotted to war veterans and widows of the World War I, made friends among people of, of all walks of life. And few of them were in Theresienstadt, which was a garrison town. And then the uh, transformation became from the town, which was be obvious, you know, being obliterated, the Gentiles will have got to be expelled, and the in inmates, the Jews will come. Few uh, sought my father and offered that perhaps they can be of help should we come there. Or nobody really knew where the transport had been aiming at. So that was our hope that perhaps we were not all lost in this place which we have never seen before. It was a small place which was holding 5,000 soldiers who were trained to become soldiers in the Imperial Army. So that was the purpose of this fortress. So the transportation, the transport from Prague, they were very periodically out. Few knew where to, but we have hoped that our, when our turn comes, which came in May 1942, that we will be ending in this uh, garrison town where we had at least somebody we sought who would look out for us and perhaps give us um, advice or help us. We didn't have uh, the foggiest idea what's in store for us. We knew that all we can take with is 50 kilograms of basic things, which was clothing, because we have known that in east of Europe, the winters are rough and we, uh, I knew that you cannot buy anything if you are an inmate somewhere. So we packed 50 kilograms as much as we could into suitcases or backpacks, which we were to, about to take with us. So gradually, people were leaving from Prague, but never any message. But from our family, and I had about 50 family members, we all lived in Prague. My uncles, my brothers of my mother, and sisters of my father were all in, mainly involved in business. My father was the only one in the family who was a civil servant. The rest had their businesses and some were industrialized. So I think we were, no, nobody was called at first. And you know, we kind of kept on hoping, but our call then came in May 1942, in which we were informed to present ourselves with 50 kilograms of basic items at the site of the annual exhibition 
which is uh, till today the place there where business people display their wares once a year. And nearby is a railway station, Bubne, from which these uh, tra uh, trains were dispatched to these ominous eastern locations. So there we came, and that was a, I, I don't know if I can, if you can imagine it from a gradual uh, normal living in a home as a family. You suddenly come to a huge place where there are hundreds of people. You, there are no washrooms or anything for your basic hygiene. There were huge latrines. Um, I remember this till today, how traumatic experience that was for my sister and I to use something like that, not only for us, for each and every member of the transport. So it, it, I don't know if you, if I'm presenting it clearly enough. So it, the trauma was going very quickly, very brutally, and very graphically on us day by day by day. And of course, we didn't get there any food, but we used, we brought with us from home out uh, all what we hoped will last us before we re reach this final destination. And two days late, in that place, really, they just took our keys from the apartment if we had any, if he still had a watch or any valuables, because as inmates, you don't need this type of thing which civilians are using, according to judgment of the Nazi policy. And when the train moved, I remember that it was that silence, although it was packed, jam-packed with people, why it's a silence? Because everybody was silently praying and of fearing what's going to be on the end of this Right, and till today I can tell you when I, have, when I have to use train, somehow the memories do come back. That anxious anticipation, what is on the end of that train ride? And in our case, we, as we expected and hoped, the train stopped two hours into the journey. We were ordered to pick up our backpacks and march to the fortress, which at that time didn't have the extension of the railway tracks yet into it. And there we were ordered into the stables of the cavalry, which of course was disbanded because when the Czech army was dissolved, everything was disbanded. So we were ordered into the stables and there we were ordered to wait. And now it became, in our case, the imperative to reach that gentle friend of my father who didn't know where we, you know, the communication wasn't there in those days like today. Nobody had phones, even people were, not persecuted, uh, let alone a Jew. So we couldn't call, uh, uh, let people know what has happened. So now it meant when we re uh, arrived there to let him know, do something for us before before too late. And, uh, you know, because I was the youngest and the kind of least visible skinny kid, I s sneaked out of the stables and I did find him. And eventually I returned back, which all of this is, was connected with an enormous danger to your life, because if I would have run into a German officer, they shot to kill. They did not issue any warnings. But I returned, and uh, they were waiting, and three days later, there became an order that we will be uh, moving on, uh, go on trains again, and that uh, we will be amalgamated with another transport. That was very shocking to us, because we still remember in the transport. And we somehow intuitively, and also maybe partially knowledge, they knew that the further east, the worse it will get. I don't know how people speculated, but it was a correct speculation. But minute last, when the loading week started, our names were called, my father, mother, my sister and I, and we were exempted and ordered to march into the camp proper, into the Theresienstadt camp. The rest of the people, all 5,000 of them, ended up three days later in a death camp called Manitrostinets, which is a, which was a death camp near in Belarus, near Minsk. And they were gassed there in those huge lorries, which had rerouted the exhaust pipe into the cabin, which was jam packed with uh, people who arrived uh, by the train. That, was, of course, we didn't know. That was a, the Germans tried very hard to keep this as a secret that uh, although everybody feared and was whispered about it, the full uh, expectation of the execution upon arrival wasn't officially, of, wasn't officially shared with us. But we have, now we are in Theresienstadt. My father was led to the barracks of men who, who were in huge halls and they didn't have any benefit of mattresses or bunks. Women had been, my mother, sister and I, 
to the women barracks, which had three tier bunks and uh, to the higher level, you had to crawl on a ladder. So this uh, started our life as, as inmates. And of course, uh, the, the transformation was uh, unimaginably difficult because, you know, you cannot imagine that you, we were in barracks where you know, military was, there were uh, huge uh, shared uh, lavatories. Uh, and everything was so full. And we have about one life, life uh, dis division distribution of food around lunchtime, and which was, of course, uh, not much anticipated, but always a very disappointing part of our day. So to summarize, stay a day in a camp. The, the worst of it was the fear of the tomorrow, or maybe even the fear of the next hour, which might be calling you to be deported further because the transport deportations were ongoing. We never knew who will come and where he was going. But we never had any letters from those who have left. So we never really knew. That fear was magnified by the time as it elapsed because it's obvious that something very dark is unfolding further on in the East. Then another hardship of every concentration camp was the hard labor because we were, uh, really it was a back breaking work we were assigned to do, and the starvation. And of course, with, uh, the, the, the deficiency, the food withdrawal was not really that the German couldn't have given us another slice of bread, or that they couldn't have given us another ladle of soup. It was because the lack of food was another weapon to destroy us. The more people died of starvation, the lesser they will have to kill or gas where the final place for us was projected to be. So. Uh, uh, this is our start of life in Theresienstadt. I have had a privilege or the good luck to meet a man who kept us there, who helped us, but who soon after our arrival was uh, reported to the Germans that he is um, helping Jews, which was in the German jurisprudence a felony. So he disappeared from our life and I've never heard from him again and never met him again, only after the war. I have learned his, his dark fate. And this was he met to every man who tried to somehow help a Jew. If in the eyes of the Nazis, he was a criminal. So uh, his uh, potential help was taken away from us. And in the beginning of the uh, work assignment, my sister was assigned to work in the commando in the fields, which grew some vegetables and fruit for the Germans. And that was a plum commando because uh, they could have, when it not looked, they could have smuggled and date my sister did, tomato, onion, or whatever they worked with to the camp. So this helped enormously in the first days of our adaptation to the camp. But uh, starvation was uh, an ongoing problem. And of course, this type of life of starvation, this, uh, withdrawal of sufficient hygiene and uh, lodgings, was very much uh, lend itself to spread of epidemics. So we read from cholera over typhus uh, uh, and in, uh, every possible contagious disease there. And we had, the camp was always infested with lice and any other vermin because it was impossible in these uh, numbers, which were pushed into that small locality to keep some kind of control over that. But the Germans never worried about that because there was always another transport going to the east and with that, people were disappearing, never to come back again. So if I would have got to uh, uh, summarize the, the month and eventually which turned into years of my life there, it was the anxiety of if there is a tomorrow, if there is even the next hour there. And of course, how are those I love so dearly and could not protect going to cope with the next hour. And that was, a, uh, for me as a teenager, an enormous problem because uh, it, there was no way you could have provided for those you loved a better food or better lodging, no matter what you would do. So um, the, as the uh, situation went, my grandmother who arrived with the um, Prague Jewish old folks home a month after us, uh, she was the first one who passed away. And she already arrived unconscious. And I remember my father who, kissed her when she was already gone, that he said that uh, this is a blessing that she never knew 
what has happened to the family she loved so dearly and doted on. And thereafter, uh, strangely enough, my, my sister who was two years my senior, always athletic and energetic, she came down with a trivial infection, really. It was just a strep throat. But because there was no medication, there were many physicians there who were inmates, but there were no medications. So if then nothing could have been done for her, so she gradually lingered for almost three months and we lost her there. And then also, of course, was a final blow my parents could have absorbed because to see your child going down here and without being able to help is crushing blow to anybody, let alone the middle-aged couple as my parents were. So this way we have uh, been trying to um, make the in between, of course, they were calling uh, into transport for us to be deported to the East. And we have, everybody tried always to wiggle out somehow, which was never very easy, but somehow I, somehow I have succeeded in that part, which was, um, uh, which preoccupied all my, all my time and uh, energies in that camp. Above and beyond, of course, the fact that I had to work 12 hour shifts uh, like every other inmate. So I think that uh, after my sister's passing, um, my family still, in Theresian shot, the, those who died were put on every, every day, uh, end of the day on these hearses and we were allowed to accompany uh, that sad cargo till the end of the town. And from then on, it was uh, brought to um, crematories where the bodies were incinerated. So I, my, my parents still were able to walk with my sister after the casket of my sister. And after that, it, my father died not so long thereafter. So this is a, a, a very sad story of a family and immediately they like mine were thousands if not millions of others only they did not have that one voice who returned who said he have lived some 50 people who were my relatives and by 1945 when I have returned back and I was uh, after medical assistance put my feet again there was nobody who would have come back and I hoped although I knew that my immediate family died and I was present when it happened. But I hope that the others, because they were cousins and people who were young and uh, <laughs> to my memory in good shape, but that nobody ever returned. That was a crushing blow, which has hit again, the handful of survivors, 1945, who tried to grasp what, what to do now with the life, which has been broken up so badly, that we suddenly realized that not only we have lost everybody we have loved. Our, we lost all our families. We have lost all our assets because everything was stolen from us. We have lost uh, our, to a great degree our health and we didn't have skill to sustain ourselves. We expected to fend for yourself. And in Prague, there was no, nobody who would take somebody who is 17, 18, doesn't know a thing and it doesn't even have a strength to scrub the floor or the stairs. So it was a very difficult start uh, of new life, which some didn't succeed. Some of us tried very hard and, you know, worked the way out of this very deep misery, which, which was the end of the one time very striving Jewish community in heart of Europe. So I don't know if you have any questions or if you want me to continue in some way. So can you let me know? Melissa? Hi, Vera. Um, can, you can, can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Um, okay, so uh, thank you so much. Uh, I was wondering if you could potentially, just because you jumped a little bit ahead at the end there, would you be able to talk a little bit more about your liberation and sort of what that experience was like? Yeah, about what? About liberation. Oh, the liberation. Well, you know, the liberation, we didn't have, we didn't know in camp how well or badly the uh, war uh, uh, proceeds because of course we didn't have newspaper. Nobody talked to us. You know, we were the isolated uh, 
people who were doing these chores and uh, uh, we didn't know. Uh, but we did, did presume towards April 45 that uh, there must be something strange in the East because they, they started to receive to Theresien Shad death marchers. These are people from the Eastern part as the Russian army pulled from East to West, liberated on many of those death camps and they couldn't kill all of the inmates who were still alive. So they forced them on the frozen waste of high, highways to the innermost camp, which was still this Theresienstadt, which was supposed to be dissolved at that time uh, because it was perceived as uh, no longer needed. But when the day of liberation came, which was May 1945, I remember the camp was in a desolate state, there were mountains of corpses, everything was, um, nobody had strength anymore to cart the corpses to the crematories. Anything but moved really was just the lies. The place was overrun with life, epidemics and misery. And outside the walls, the thick walls of the camp were some noises, which we didn't know how to, what to ascribe it to. So when we, some of us who were still able to walk near the walls, realized that from distance are some tanks are approaching and then we, so that was again the fear, what kind of tanks are these? These are the Germans, so they will kill us. But as they approach nearer, I remember we saw on the turrets, the sickle and hammer, which are the insignia of the then Soviet Union. And for us, that was a day, that was a moment which I till today do not find words to do justice, what you will be felt. Because if you do live so many years in that type of fear of, next hour, if you don't have hope for uh, liberation or any freedom, and all of a sudden, unexpectedly, you see tanks in, which are manned by young smiling soldiers, which wave to you and throw bread down to us, because they we looked a part of the emaciated inmates, so they knew who they were dealing with. And I cannot begin to describe to you, and it's very hard to find words, to see that heaven took pity upon us, upon the few who are still breathing and send the liberators. So the, that moment is uh, etched into my memory till my last day, because uh, I still see the smiles of the boys who were so, so friendly and so sweet and so kind. Of course, they couldn't stay because they were ordered by the army to push on to Prague. And then they soon realized they have a big problem on hand because the place was uh, uh, infested with uh, epidemics and because it's in the heart of the countryside, so the Russians were afraid that this will spread epidemic bright and, bright and white. So they quarantined the place again and we were locked up again and now started the slow process of uh, what to do. So first, you know, the Russians commanded an army which clean, cleansed the place, you know, burned uh, corpses and the uh, uniforms or the lice infested what was lying around. And then came the medical corps, Rus Russian and Czech as well, who brought not only the doctors and nurses, but they brought in also medication and food. And I don't know if you again can somebody, <laughs> it's hard for you guys to imagine what it means to see a cauldron with a cooked cereal of people who never had their fill for years. And all of a sudden, the, the Russian army, though, fully aware that you cannot f feed normal food starvelings who for years did not have enough to eat. They knew it from the siege of Leningrad, which was happening during the Second World War. So they brought in cooked cereal, kind of bluish. It didn't have fat, no salt, no sugar, but we could have had a liberal amount. And now that was uh, for us, you know, I don't, it's very difficult for people to imagine what meant, what withdrawal of food, chronic f uh, hunger, what it really is, what it does to your personality. So very slowly, uh, the, the Russians began to consolidate, uh, the army units began to consolidate the situation. And it took uh, several months and it's uh, thousands of people have still died, um, among them, some of them who came to our help the medical corps from Prague and from Russia, because uh, the contamination uh, didn't take ex exception to the, to the healthy, uh, those who were not inmates. 
but ever slowly, very slowly, it became somehow obvious that a uh, few people will survive. And then started the triage, what to do with people then. And the, the um, adaptation, uh, you know, the mindset of an inmate, I remember distinctly when I was a little better off, they asked me where I was from. So I said, from Prague. Ne next question, do you want to go back? I said, indeed. Only I never crossed my mind that I have nobody there. You know, as an inmate, I kind of, Prague was the last dream, last home, last safe place to be. And somebody asked me if I want to go there. Indeed, I do. But when I stood, when they put me on a jeep and told me to get off in Prague, then I realized I have nowhere to go. And I stood in the street in Prague, and I remember the passers-by looking at me and my uh, kind of prisoner smock I had on. And I became, of course, self-conscious. So um, what now? I knew that the apartment we had, everything was long gone. So I remember that the janitor of the finance ministry lived nearby. So somehow I staggered there. And I remember I came there and when I knocked on the door, they didn't recognize me. And this is not uh, surprising because they knew the uh, you know, bouncing 13, 14 years old girl. And all of a sudden he stood the skeleton with uh, almost no hair and uh, you know, <laughs> dressed in some kind of bizarre outfit. So they didn't want to let me in. So it took some persuasion and memories to the day to convince them. And then they, of course, relented. And I soon, when they let me in, I collapsed and had a bit to be brought to the hospital again. So it was a very difficult uh, road to um, rehabilitation. But the worst, I think, to all of us who survived was the fact that we couldn't save anybody. That, um, the fact that I was the only surviving member of a family of 50 was not an exception. An exception was if you had some cousin or some distant relative somewhere who came. And I kept on hoping, I remember, till the fall of 1946, that perhaps you know people were sick somewhere in remote areas and maybe somebody will come back. But um, it was not to happen and eventually the Red Cross and uh, Jewish community pieced with me together, every single family members, their destiny. You see, the part that I know, heartbroken as I am about it, every place where my relatives died is, the, is a really, the Germans did it. They were so proud of the handiwork. They had actual accurate statistics where who went and where these people ended. So I know exactly where they have been murdered. But it was really not a help because um, it was, uh, uh, I, I did hope in Theresia that somebody somewhere will come back. But after a while, uh, I have realized that uh, this was a horrible crime committed on us and that I have got to pull up and do best I can with this life. And I have uh, decided that uh, whatever I can contribute, that humanity should know that this should never ever happen again, that men should never look down or with a bias of prejudice against another man, that I should do my share to contribute, that this should never happen again. And I have this faith till today that I will do anything at any time to prevent or to teach people that basic of our survival, especially now, in time of weapons of mass destruction lies in tolerance and mutual respect of getting along with one another. And to this, I, have, I devoted enormous amount of energies and folk, as Marisa said, to thousands of people and trying to warn that deviate from the, this type of policy is really could be potentially end of humanity. So I think if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Vera. Uh, so I have a couple of questions that have come through, um, but I have actually one that I know we as a, as a team have also wanted to ask you. Um, in recent years, uh, as I know, as someone who's become you know, quite close with you, that you've become more and more interested in the aspect of resistance and sort of how that's taught and very frequently overlooked in the general education that people receive about the Holocaust. 
So I was wondering if you could speak more to how you see resistance and how it should be portrayed in, in Holocaust education. Well, I think the Holocaust education, according to my judgment, according to my experiences, is such essential part of what we can give to the next generation into their road, into their future lives. Because uh, at one point, our lives, when I was a kid, looked relatively safe. And that was without uh, having weapons of mass destruction threatening our survival. But nowadays, where we know that the world is still not pacified, there are still people who have prejudices, who are, who are hateful, how can we not use this enormous tragedy to, to teach the young people the uh, horrors of uh, not being able to get along. And I think there are a lot of aspects of uh, the Shoah in which we could show them people who stood tall and tried to resist, who, who, who escaped from camps, who fought back. And any camp almost had a rebellion. If I had time, I could sit here with you hours on end and we could recount many things in which people planned rebellion. Some of it succeeded partially, some of it did not. But it was not that we went down like sheep to slaughter, which some insult its uh, definitions followed us. And I think that the future generation can learn an enormous amount of uh, life philosophy, how to create a future life if they draw from the lessons of the Holocaust. Because it is a Holocaust is not only a lesson of evil, but it's also a lesson of man's courage to stand tall, fight back. It's also a story of people who risk their lives and often lost their lives to help their Jewish neighbors or those they have loved and cared about. It is multi-layered story which morality of man can find foundation which we should offer to the young generation which we are preparing for their, for their road to life and we should give them the best weapons that they should forge their way in a safety and security. Because I, to tell you the truth, I think that we were I will not put it as an accusation, but in wildest dreams in my young years would never anybody have thought that something like this can, can occur. Because after Napoleonic Wars, you know, who taught the ghettos, the wars of the ghettos, Jews did not think that anybody would uh, systematically in cold blood murder them in gas chambers or, 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 or drown them in ponds and several violent murders like that. So I think we would do service to our people, not to be necessarily graphic, but to provide them with a moral understanding of the uh, amorality of the intolerance and of the people who were the unsung heroes. There are thousands of unsung heroes who did wonderful things in camps to help one another, to try to delight themselves in the, the mouthful of food to help somebody. And we do not share it with our young people. And we, I think we owe it to them. And I would think that we should really invest a lot of our energies, not to forget that this painful story has got a message. And we are, I think, obliged should carry the message on. And so, and I know you're sort of referring to uh, the group that we commonly call the Righteous Among Nations. And I'm curious as to what exact lessons do you think young people can apply that knowledge of righteous among nations sort of how do you think they can use that in their own lives or i mean even understanding uh current global events where of course we see a huge rise in intolerance and hatred around the world how do you think those lessons from the righteous among nations can can help them deal with that well, you know, there, there, is an, there were some really great heroes who pick up a cause of, uh, of people, uh, even people who were far away in the move from, from Jewish destiny. Let's say, take uh, Wallenberg, a Swedish nobleman who decided that uh, uh, what's happening in Hungary is a mass murder, of course, and he will, and he helped, and he saved thousands of Jewish lives. There were people, that the man who lost his life because of my family, did not have uh, the possibility of these numbers, but he too saved lives at a cost of his own because these people, Wallenberg didn't survive the war. You know, as you know, he was in and lost the life in Soviet prison. The man who saved my life lost his life in Nazi prison. Many people were uh, no, having the nobility of 
courage to help those who were once their friends, who were born in a wrong side of history, to help them. I think that is a lesson we teach loyalty and value of friendship, which again, we should share with our next generation. Not everything is success, which is important, but there are values which we should instill in the minds and hearts of our next generation. And I would very much hope that part of it is um, uh, righteous among nations should be part of it. Or the heroes uh, from the camp who, like Dr. Korchak, like Freddie Hirsch, they are south of them who sacrificed their lives and could have had a little better fate if they wouldn't have cared about those kids who they wanted to help in the worst night and darkest hour. So I think this is a, something which we owe really to the new generation. It's not that it's a, we should, we really owe it to them to tell them that there are values way above and beyond for uh, maybe um, enjoying life and nothing wrong with that, but uh, that we really should, the morality that there were people who were walking tall and were uh, died uh, as heroes and are unsung heroes because we do not tell them who they were. But I think we should invest um, uh, teaching into it and time into it. And I think it, we would never regret it. Absolutely, and I, I totally, totally agree. Um, so as you know, many of the people on this call, if not everyone on this call is coming from Canada uh, across the whole nation. And I know for a lot of people and for a lot of students, they're often very curious as to why you chose Canada as the country that you came to and how you ultimately decided to begin sharing your story with Canadian students. So I was wondering if you could speak more to that. Well, you know, the fact that we came to Canada and I'm very grateful to Canada because it gave us a chance to uh, settle again, develop in a country, democratically ruled country. It, uh, I, my gratitude to Canada is bottomless and endless. And, uh, but it was uh, really a uh, uh, form of family reunification because by that time I was married and the sister of my husband lived in Toronto and the Canadian um, legislation allows family reunification uh, in a framework of getting these people of the family which were torn apart together. So this is where we have arrived here. And I, I think that uh, we have um, had a fun, like any immigrant, of course, you, you find your difficulties, but you, know, you try to uh, make your roots. You, you, I have two sons who I'm very glad and f proud of. The, I think that they got the education in Canada and I'm very grateful for that. But why I decided to go back and talk to public amidst all these um, challenges because I had a job and my, my husband was ailing. I had a um, coincidental uh, running together with the Holocaust denier. You may know what I'm referring to. But in um, the 1980s, when I was looking for a second job, like post my retirement, I decided to become a court interpreter and translator. And by sheer coincidence, I, was, uh, I went to uh, 361 University Avenue Criminal Court where there was a trial of Mr. Zundel. You might not have heard the name, Aaron Zundel, he was a German national who uh, was accused. He was denying that the Holocaust had happened. And if it happened, then it must have been in some much less than numbers. This is all a spin of Jewish imagination. This is all a Jewish uh, type of sabotage or trying to extort money from Germany as a restitution. And uh, as under those uh, with those falsifications, he was printed, printing flyers and books and mailing them around Canada and North American continent. And a, a, a lady, I think her name was Mrs. Citron, took him to court of law because he was uh, uh, denying the truth. And I, by, by sheer coincidence, preparing myself for another job, ran into this type of trial. And I sat there, I remember, I, long after everything was over, I still couldn't pick up my energy and go home. I couldn't believe that in my lifetime, when everything has been so well documented, because Holocaust is a well-documented tragedy, that there is a, it's possibility that people stand up and say it didn't happen. So that shock never wore off really. And I came home and remember I said to my husband, you know, we really didn't do we survivors, because my husband was a survivor too, uh, all what we were supposed to, because there are people who deny it. And with uh, passage of time, 
memories fade. With passage of time, we won't be here. There will be nobody who say, I was there and I can describe to you what has happened and what has been, people were shot and starved. You know, right now we still can do that. So I said, we cannot just let it be. So I said to myself, if I, no matter what, I have got to publish my memories and people must know it has to be documented because there are people who for agenda of their own would deny the evident of millions of people who perished because of demented and deranged hatred of the Nazi party in Germany. So then I set about and started to see if anybody's working in that direction and who is interested. And gradually I got, <coughs> excuse me, connected with the Holocaust Center with you guys and started to talk to people to put in my share that people should not be believe. And it is my fear till today that uh, this passage of time, when these th things become historically more and more removed and the memory have faded, that people will uh, think, oh, maybe it really wasn't all that bad, you know? But, uh, and we have a pictorial documentation. We have got the photos taken from those camps, but somehow I think if people have a vicious agenda, they can, deny that too. So I think that it would be very negligent and irresponsible from us to allow it to happen. Because we owe it, we owe it to the next generation that no repeated mis atrocity should ever occur again. It is our responsibility. They were not around the young ones. Uh, they don't know who to believe. So it's us to teach them. It's us to instill in them the knowledge and the morality of uh, people, how they should co interact with one another. Mm -hmm. This is my firm belief, and I honestly believe that we really should uh, invest into it all what a lot time and curriculum allow us. Absolutely. And of course, I know, I mean, everyone here on staff and everyone who's joined us definitely agrees with that. And I'm just mindful of the time. So I wanted to ask you one sort of final question. And of course, as always, we want to end on a, on a positive note, if possible. And I'm curious uh, about sort of your optimistic view of the future. How do you see uh, Holocaust education? Do you, do you have a lot of optimism for uh, the next decade, next couple decades? How do you see this taking place in the future? I, I do. I always, always was optimistic. Even in darkest days, I forced myself to believe in the good in men. And I believe that we can do, with the Holocaust, we can do very well. Look, we have such wonderful resources. We have libraries. We have people who have the knowledge. We just have got to set the time aside and make it interesting enough. And I also understand that we are now dealing with different teenagers. This is a, a generation which is uh, with uh, Google, with, uh, having at their fingertips all the information. They do not have patience with long narratives and with long details. We have got to make it interesting. We can have it interaction. I know when I speak to students and when I can involve them in a conversation, one-to-one -one on a group conversation, we have a wonderful time, but we do not have got to flood them with dates or names of the camps. This is the secondary part, the, the lack of morality, the enormity of the crime is important that we should teach them. And yes, I'm optimistic because we have a very educated a group of people who believe in it and people like yourself who invest their energies into it. And I think we are I think incumbent upon us to do that. And I wish you would continue by, before my past lifetime, because I think it is a very important message to send to the new generation. And God bless you for doing it and continue to do that. Amazing. Thank you so much, Vera, uh, for your story and for sharing that with us today. And of course, uh, all of your incredible insights. Every time I talk to you, I always learn something new, even though I've listened to this testimony I mean, across Canada. Every time I learn something new. Uh, I'm going to quickly turn the conversation over to Michael Levitt, FSW, uh, FSWC's CEO, for a few closing remarks. Michael? Thank you for everything. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, Vera, thank you for your, um, I, you know, you, you said it at the beginning, it's painful, um, but it's inspiring. And it's your voice and the voice of the other survivors uh, that, that really is uh, the key to us educating future generations because we see the challenges, we see them all too clearly. As you've said, we see it rising around us today 
and uh, we need to uh, you know, make sure that we're continuing to uh, have you tell your story, uh, whether it's on forums like this or to schools or any way that, uh, that Wiesenthal can do it. We're really so appreciative um, for you being here today. I, I also want to take the opportunity to bring greetings on behalf of Erwin Kotler. Uh, Erwin is the executive uh, director and founder of the uh, Wallenberg Center and this sp Survivor Speaker Series is a partnership between the Wallenberg and the Wiesenthal Centers, um, uh, two individuals whose names uh, we, we have and who did unbelievable things in the wake of the war uh, to be able to shine a light and bring justice and accountability to the story of survivors like Vera. So um, to, the, to all at the Wallenberg Center, thank you. To the staff, to everybody at Wiesenthal that's been involved um, in making today's presentation possible. Thank you to all of you, Emily, uh, Melissa, Daniela, uh, and Elena, to all of our education team. Thank you for the work that you're doing. And last but certainly not least, to those of you that tuned in this afternoon um, from wherever you are, whether uh, you're you know, at work or in your homes, um, you obviously understand too the importance of um, hearing and learning and soaking up every bit of Vera's story so that it is never ever forgotten and that we never ever again um, have to face such horrors. So to everybody that's tuned in uh, to hear uh, Vera's uh, story, thank you so much. And uh, we've got uh, several more of these presentations lined up, not just from Holocaust survivors, um, but also uh, uh, people from other communities that have faced um, some of the worst hardships, uh, whether it's in uh, Rwanda or, or uh, the Rohingya or other places. So please keep an eye open and we'll make sure to get you the info in upcoming presentations.